Station wagons are few and far between these days, and if you do come across one, it's probably going to be a pseudo crossover. However, there is a sneaky, sinister underbelly to the station wagon world, comprised entirely of vehicles like this Swedish monster. Say hello to the Volvo V60 T8 Polestar Engineered. There's a lot of wagony goodness coming up, but first I need you to do me a favor. Please be sure to go ahead and subscribe to the Motor One YouTube channel and find us on all of your favorite social media using the handle at MotorOne.com. You can also stay up to date on all things Volvo, Polestar, and otherwise at the website MotorOne.com. Before we get into the driving experience, let's take a quick second and talk about history because you all know how much I love history. And where better to do that than in Polestar's native Sweden? Just kidding, we're not in Sweden. As you can see, the mountains above Southern California got hit with a nice little snowstorm the other night, and we figured we'd take advantage of the conditions to test out the V60s through the road all-wheel drive. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Polestar started life in the mid-1990s, building specially tuned race-ready versions of the Volvo 850 wagon for British and Swedish touring car championships. Then within about 10 or 15 years, Polestar started tuning on-road versions of Volvo's products like the C30 hatchback and the S60 and V60 sedan and wagon. In 2015, Volvo brought the Polestar brand completely in-house and then spun it off to create a fully electric premium brand that someday should go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the likes of the Porsche Taycan. But even today, the racing brand makes a variety of performance enhancements for Volvo's current internal combustion lineup, ranging from chip tuning on lesser models to full-blown suspension and braking packages on flagships. That's what we're looking at here with the V60 T8 Polestar Engineered. Making use of Volvo's turbo and supercharged 2.0-liter inline-4, the V60 T8 also gets a plug-in hybrid powertrain courtesy of an 18.8 kilowatt-hour lithium battery and rear-mounted electric motor. That gives it a total of 455 horsepower and 523 pound-feet of torque, which isn't any more than a non-Polestar Volvo with the T8 powertrain, but it's still a staggering number especially when you combine it with Polestar's specially tuned, adjustable Olean's dampers and massive Brembo braking package, you end up with a sporty wagon that has some very formidable on-road performance. That subtle appearance on the outside also portends a subtly enhanced driving experience. Unlike the transition between, say, a BMW M340i and an M3, the Polestar doesn't necessarily smack you in the face with performance the moment you step behind the wheel. In fact, when you start the car, it defaults to electric prioritizing hybrid mode, which means that you probably step off the line without any engine noise whatsoever. And then when you're driving down the road and you encounter some imperfections in the pavement, it's not gonna rattle your fillings loose either. It kind of just soaks everything up and keeps on going. You really kind of have to start pushing it hard in order to feel that performance envelope expand. Now, part of that has to do with how you've set the car up before you start your drive. The Polestar comes with adjustable Olean's dampers at all four corners, but you actually have to get under the hood and take off the rear wheels if you want to adjust those. There isn't a button right here. Once you have gone to the trouble of jacking your car up and removing the wheels, adjusting the dampers is an easy process. There's a little thumb wheel that is very easy to turn. You don't need any special tools, but it doesn't change the fact that you can't alter how the car behaves on the fly. You have to pull over, bust out the jack stands, and get the thing in the air in order to make it different. It all just feels kind of buttoned down and put together. It's a really appealing balance between sport and comfort, for sure. But you've got to admit that having a button to do all of that for you would be really nice, and you do get that feature in most of the Polestar's key competitors. That nicely balanced suspension is a huge boon when you're driving the V60 hard, and in order to do that, you need to set it up right. Now, once you've got the mechanicals set up how you want them, you need to go in the infotainment system and set up Polestar driving mode, which keeps the engine permanently online, even at stoplights, so that you get the full force of this car's 455 combined horsepower. Do so and you'll be rewarded with stupendous off-the-line acceleration. Thanks to that instantaneous torque from the electric motor and the turbo and supercharged four-cylinder under the hood, there's really not any point in the rev range that the car is lacking for power. And power delivery, thanks to that electric motor, is smooth and linear. Some of Volvo's twin-charged offerings can feel a little bit lumpy in the handoff between turbocharging and supercharging, but that's not the case here. You dip into the throttle and you know exactly what you're gonna get, which is really handy when you're driving on twisty roads and in inclement weather like this. My only real problem with the powertrain is the transmission. The eight-speed automatic is pretty decent when you're just kind of trundling around town, but when you're really pushing it hard, it doesn't downshift as readily as you might want for corner entry and stuff like that. That wouldn't necessarily be a problem if it were easy to change gears manually, but the Polestar doesn't even offer paddle shifters on the backside of the steering wheel. 
When I drove the S60 a couple of weeks ago, I thought that the lack of a paddle shifters was kind of just because that was supposed to be a more luxury oriented product. But then when I got in the Polestar and it didn't have them, I knew something was wrong. The only way to change gears manually is via the Orafors Crystal Gear Selector, so at least you're kind of holding on to something nice when you are swapping gears. But it doesn't change the fact that when you're in the middle of a corner and you realize you need a little bit more engine braking than you originally thought, you have to take your hand off the steering wheel to make that happen. That's just kind of a bummer. The final piece of the Polestar's performance puzzle are those Brembo brakes, and they work phenomenally. They stop the car in very short distances indeed, and even though I've been driving it pretty hard all day long, I haven't really noticed too much in the way of brake fade. Part of that's because the Polestar includes regenerative braking as part of its hybrid powertrain, and it will even do a full one-pedal stop if you let it. It's also very well-tuned. When you let off the accelerator, you don't get that full regen right away tossing you forward. Instead, it kind of just eases into it, which is really, really nice. And it works pretty well in performance driving situations, which isn't something you can say of every regenerative braking system. Put it all together and you're left with a very capable feeling performance car. Now, I'm not gonna lie to you and tell you that the Volvo is incredibly hard-edged and involving and thrilling. It's honestly not. If you want that, you're probably better off going with something like a BMW M3. Taken for what it is, the Polestar is very confidence-inspiring and exciting to drive, especially on a road like this, where you've got these big, wide sweepers and the occasional patch of gravel getting in your way. You've just got tons of traction, the car behaves exactly how you think it will, and like I said, it might not want to bite you in the ass and that might take away some of the fun factor, but it still is a really enjoyable car to drive quickly. In spite of that performance messaging, the Polestar is still a pretty comfortable vehicle when you just want to go for a casual drive. Those Oleans dampers are definitely a little bit stiff right now. It still has a decently smooth ride. You kind of feel the bumps, but you don't necessarily feel a ton of secondary motions and vibrations. You kind of just get this nicely damped whap with every obstacle you encounter on the pavement. If you do want it smoother, you can have it smoother. You just gotta jack it up and take off the rear wheels like I mentioned before. There's also not a lot of noise complaints inside the Polestar either, especially when you have it in hybrid or pure modes, both of which maximize the use of the electric motor wherever possible. Do so and you're left with a car that's pretty serene and gets thoroughly decent fuel economy. Now when you dip into the accelerator a little bit too far and the gas engine fires up, you feel a bit of a shudder come through the vehicle and some noise from underneath the hood. It's a little bit problematic, but it's not a huge deal. You kind of get used to it after a day of driving. Still, I wish it was just that little bit more refined. Overall though, don't have too many complaints. Being a plug-in hybrid, the V60 Polestar is capable of 40 miles of EPA-rated all-electric driving before the gas engine kicks on. I have to say, I think that number is just a little bit optimistic. In my experience, I've seen anywhere between 25 and 35 miles of fully electric driving, but once you do completely deplete that battery, the car just reverts to being a traditional hybrid, achieving up to about 31 miles per gallon combined, a number that I do think is completely realistic and attainable. The V60 Polestar recharges overnight using a 120 volt outlet, taking just about eight hours to go from completely empty to completely full. That's good news for folks who don't have a dedicated charging station at home, but if you do have access to a 240 volt outlet, you can expect an empty to full recharge to happen in right about five hours. Now it must be said, those charging numbers aren't particularly impressive for something that only has a 40 mile EPA rated range, but bear in mind that this is kind of an earlier generation of plug-in hybrids when we didn't necessarily have super high capacity electrical architectures. And since most people in America have a commute that's less than 30 miles, you can expect the vast majority of your driving to happen without burning a single drop of gasoline, at least until you come up to the canyons to have fun. Now you won't be too surprised to learn that most of my complaints and most of my praise from the S60 that I drove not long ago carry over almost completely unchanged to the Polestar. There aren't that many changes from that vehicle to this one. It has the same vertically oriented touchscreen that measures 9 inches, the same 12.3 inch digital instrument cluster, the same interface, it all pretty much ports over completely unchanged. I do have some issues with this infotainment system, particularly that you can't make fine adjustments to the climate controls without digging into the touchscreen. And I'm not sure if my phone needs a software update or my charging cord is bad or what, but I have had some issues connecting to CarPlay. It'll occasionally just refuse to acknowledge that my phone is connected. That's only a problem because this car requires a wired connection. There's no wireless CarPlay available like you might find in some of the competitors. Once everything's all connected and ready to go, the Bowers & Wilkins audio system is fantastic. It's a $3,200 option on lesser Volvos, but it's actually standard on the Polestar, which helps justify the price premium. 
Now, just because it's a Polestar doesn't mean that this particular Volvo has forgotten its reputation for safety. Everything comes standard on the V60, ranging from automatic emergency braking to pilot assist, adaptive cruise control, and lane keep assistance. You do have to have your hands on the wheel at all times, so this car doesn't necessarily cross the line over into semi-autonomous driver assistance. And it has to be said that the Volvo doesn't do a phenomenal job of keeping you perfectly centered in the lane lines. Instead, it does bounce back and forth between them just a little bit. But for the company that practically invented automotive safety, the V60 Polestar does a fine job of keeping you pretty well distanced from the traffic around you so that you can have a strong dose of confidence on a long trip. All right, regardless of what you see on the mountainside behind me or the ground in front of me, I promise you we are still in sunny Southern California, not Gothenburg, but it is freezing and I have to have this jacket on, so I apologize in advance for any rustling you might hear. Let's just do our best to ignore it and talk about the Polestar and have some fun while we're at it. Now, you're gonna have to squint pretty hard to find the differences between a Polestar V60 and uh, what was formerly known as the R-Design V60, and it's because they haven't actually done any substantial body modifications. There aren't any big fender flares, the bumper design is pretty much the same. Overall, it kinda just feels very familiar to anyone who's ever seen a V60 driving down the road. The 19-inch wheels have a unique design to the Polestar engineered, and they hide a massively upgraded braking package sourced from Brembo. You can tell you're looking at something special if you see the bright gold brake calipers that carry the Brembo and Polestar branding. It's just a tiny little subtle detail that absolutely pops when this car's standing still, and it just looks fantastic. Otherwise, there just aren't that many changes. Like any other plug-in hybrid Volvo, there isn't even a set of tailpipes on the Polestar, kind of helping denote that this car has an eco-friendly performance mission. The cabin of the Polestar is lifted pretty much completely intact from any other Volvo 60 series product, like the S60 that I reviewed recently. You can check out a link to that video right here. As you'll see from that review, the Polestar is pretty much identical. The same beautifully trimmed cabin, the same lovely accents of aluminum, the same optional Bowers & Wilkins audio system, the same cloth accents on the seats, the same Orifor's crystal gear selector. The only major change are these beautiful bright gold seat belts that match the brake calipers on the outside. Now that we're done having fun out on the road, let's talk gold tax. The Volvo V60 Polestar Engineered has a starting price of $71,645, and with the power tailgate and adjustable luggage cover, this car has an as-tested price of $72,190. That puts this car in kind of some weird territory pricing-wise. It's not as expensive as a BMW M3, and it does have standard all-wheel drive, but it's a lot more expensive than a BMW M340i xDrive. So you really kind of can't figure out where to place this car in the automotive hierarchy. It's also a lot less expensive than any genuine performance station wagon on the market, about 40 grand underneath the Mercedes AMG E63 and Audi RS6, and probably 50 or $60,000 less than a Porsche Panamera Sport Turismo with a similar level of performance. For all those reasons, it's kind of hard to figure out exactly where this vehicle falls. If you want maximum attack performance, you should honestly just budget a little bit of extra money and jump into a BMW M3 that's gonna be far more thrilling and involving. And at the same time, if a performance badge isn't necessarily your priority, then you could do very well by either a V60 Cross Country or an S60 T8 like the one that I drove. But if you're that unique individual that wants something with some panache and some style to it, as well as a lot of cargo space and a thoroughly enjoyable driving experience, there's absolutely no other vehicle on the market that does what the V60 Polestar Engineered does. I'm gonna sum it up like this. The Volvo V60 Polestar Engineered feels like the perfect car for someone who's maybe outgrown their Volkswagen GTI Mark 7.5. I mean, think about it. They both have premium interiors, great balance of ride comfort and handling, approachable and confidence-inspiring performance. The list goes on and on even though they might be a little bit more expensive to buy than some of their similar contemporary rivals. And then of course, there's no underestimating the street value of a high performance wagon. There's just something so appealing about a family truckster that can also absolutely kick some ass in the canyons. For that reason alone, this is probably my favorite car on the market right now, and I promise you I'm not hyperbolizing. It's the cheapest high performance wagon, it's probably the most stylish, and I absolutely love it for all those reasons and more.